Charles Williams. I'm the Chief Judge of the 12th Judicial Circuit. That's uh, Sarasota, Manatee, and DeSoto County for you out-of-circuit people. I want to thank you all for coming out this morning. I know the weather was pretty rough. I understand it's cleared up considerably, so that's good news. Uh, before I introduce your speaker, I'm the uh, Where's the bathroom guy? So when you go outside under the stairs, uh, the bathrooms are there. I'm also silence your cell phones guy. So if you have any cell phones, uh, once this uh, presentation starts, please uh, be sure to silence them. I want to welcome you to the uh, Strategic Approaches for Eliminating Racial and Ethnic Disparities uh, event. Uh, I want to thank Jenny Donovan. And I also want to thank the uh, 12th Circuit Juvenile Justice Advisory Board Disproportionate Minority Contact Subcommittee. I'm learning all of these uh, initials uh, for uh, helping put this event on. I'm very privileged to uh, be introducing our speaker for this morning, uh, Will Helvosa, currently the Disproportionate Minority Contact Coordinator with the Gainesville Police Department. He's a retired captain from the Gainesville Police Department. He graduated from the University of Florida, where all good things come from. Uh, with a criminal justice degree. He's uh, certified in racial and ethnic disparity from Georgetown University. He's the past PBA president for the Gainesville Police Department Lieutenants. He's also an instructor for Fox Valley Technical College on DMC and procedural justice. Currently, he's serving on the board of directors for Youth Build and Child Advocacy Center in Gainesville. He's married to Rosa, they have three children, and it is my privilege to introduce Will Helvosa. Will? Okay, good morning. So this is a couple of things. First of all, this is this does not amplify my voice. So if you can, this is just for the recording. If you cannot hear me, let me know. Uh, it's got a moving microphone, evidently, where I walk back and forth, and I like to move just a little bit when I speak. So can everybody in the back hear me? Okay. Is that are we good? Thumbs up. Excellent. So a couple of things. One, uh, this is uh, uh, Manatee Educational Television (METV), and so if you want to um, get this recording, they're going to have it on uh, YouTube at uh, metv.web, web, I'm sorry, metvweb.com. It'll take about a week to put this together. Uh, and also, if you have, this is gonna be sort of a moving discussion in terms of very organic. So if you wanna ask questions while I'm going through some of the PowerPoints, uh, please feel, feel free to raise your hand. And then um, I'm gonna try, I may have to try to get you this microphone, maybe, or I'll repeat your question into the microphone. We'll try that as well. So. I don't want you running all over the place this morning, but thank you for, for offering. So a, a, just a, a few more things. One is um, I spoke at a, uh, a, a, it's called CCLP, which is a Center for Children's Law and Policy. It was a DJJ uh, implicit bias training last December 12th in, in Orlando. And I spoke, it wasn't my training, but they asked me to speak on some of the things that we are doing in Gainesville. And so I spoke for just about 20 minutes. Um, it was a two-day, uh, I guess, class that we went to, and then um, Jenny kept contact with me, and she asked me to come up and speak because you guys have a bunch of fascinating, fantastic initiatives going on, going on here uh, in Circuit 12. I'm here to tell you also that I'm not necessarily going to give you anything that you can really probably use. Maybe you can. Maybe you take away some of this stuff and, and want to elaborate on it. Maybe some of this stuff lands with you. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe some of the stuff you don't agree with, which I'm okay with. Uh, I sometimes can only speak through the lens of my discipline, which is law enforcement. So I don't, I don't know the school board in Latchville County necessarily. I think I do. I don't know DJJ necessarily what they do and what they do wrong, but I always think I do. But, and so sometimes I'll put myself out there and, and, and say things about other disciplines that we all have to work together on, believing that I know what's best, okay? So it's just a little bit maybe of our ignorance that we have, and I know we're, we sometimes kind of work within our own discipline, but uh, I really appreciate what's going on in District 12 uh, with everything, I'm sorry, Circuit 12, I'm gonna say district a few times today. Circuit 12, and, and, and at the end of the day, we're really trying to, to put ourselves out of a job. You know, it's kind of funny. We're all sitting here trying to think, oh, how can we arrest less kids and do more good work? And, and ultimately, we're gonna have to redefine our roles at some point, because when there's no kids get locked up, and there's gonna be no more placement programs, no more JPOs, no more DJJ, maybe a few less cops, unless we decide we're gonna do something differently. But at the end of the day, that's ultimately we're trying to, to improve a lot of what we see uh, day in and day out, and I've seen for 30 plus years as well. Again, I'm from the University of Florida. I hope the Gators didn't bust anybody's bracket. Nobody expected them to make it to the Elite Eight, which they did. 
The only reason they lost to South Carolina, which is real, which hurt me a lot because they couldn't make any three pointers in the second half. You guys watched the game. It was abysmal. Um, but this weekend is kind of exciting. So SEC is getting represented by South Carolina <coughs> as well. So I'm going to start, first of all, by taking off my jacket. Everybody doesn't mind. I've been wearing this thing just until you guys get here. I'm going to start with a video. I want everybody to, to watch. And we're going to have a little bit of comment. This is a Gainesville video. This is a young man. Before I get started, I'm not going to go through introductions, but let me sh show a hand. So I've got my law enforcement family is where? Put your hands up higher for me. OK. My DJJ folks are good. School board folks, judges and state attorneys, public defenders. I should probably put them all. Yeah, OK. And what other disciplines am I missing? Oh, some of our uh, Boys and Girls Club, some of our community programs. We've got Big Brothers, Big Sisters. Excellent. Um, we don't have Big Brothers, Big Sisters anymore in games, but we lost it. Ten Fen. Good. Excellent. Any other disciplines that I'm missing that are here? What's that? Mental health. Mental health. Huge. Okay. What are you for mental health? Okay. Uh, Dynamite. By the way, if you're not familiar with this college, it's fascinating. It's the first thing I'm going to do when I get back to Gainesville. No, I don't have my mic. Apologize. I'm going to give my mic. Uh, I'm going to go talk to our politicians about how come we don't have this vocational college in Alachua County. There's 49 of these in the state of Florida. Oh, we don't have one. Okay. So when you look at gaps in terms of your community, your efforts, it's jobs. A lot of my kids that I work with, and I say kids, I don't mean my three kids. I mean the kids that I work with in the community, vocation is probably one of the, the biggest needs in terms of unmet needs that they have. Okay, so this is big, so thank you. Uh, and like I said, I like to come in and share stuff with you, and usually I walk away stealing most of your ideas. So I'm, I'm, I'm big on plagiarizing, just so you know. So that's one of the benefits, I guess, of travel. I don't do this a lot. I really am not a speaker. I don't go around and do a whole lot of speaking on some of the stuff. I, again. My area of expertise is probably Gainesville, so I know what we do in Gainesville, but again, it may not fit for what you're doing in, um, in Circuit 12, okay? So, so anyway, so this young man was uh, riding his bike, uh, no light on his bike, 8 o'clock at night. The officer uh, stops him, pulls him over, and uh, I'm going to let you guys just, uh, just watch this video for a second, get your response to it. Yeah, there's some foul language in here, so I hope it doesn't offend anybody, okay? He wants him to sit down. So the officer hits his alert button. Hey, I need backup. I need backup. 1033. Everybody's racing to the scene. Yeah, fuck 
So that's a sergeant at the back of the car. Can I help you? Oh, okay, so. Bodding this man for no reason. He ain't did nothing. Taking the shoes off. Why are they taking the shoes off? But no. But I want to guess. What's that? Okay, there's a little bit more than that. Some more officers show up on the on the scene. So that's a Gainesville ta uh, traffic stop. It's not um, it's not unlike a lot of jurisdictions that have probably a very similar traffic stops or incidents or what's made what's made the papers. And so, um, does anybody got a comment on that video? What they saw was it was how that land with you? Was you were you okay with the way that we handled uh, the young man? Does that seem like a, a reasonable sort of response in terms of law enforcement riding a bike? Is that uh, what do you what do you what's your takeaway from that video with the officers? And, and in all fairness, I have some some other information. Thank you, Judge. I have some other information I can share with you. But what's sort of your takeaway from that encounter? And that's not an unusual encounter with law enforcement. That's probably. That was a typical evening, but what, what, do you, what is anybody's takeaway with what you saw? Is everybody okay with that? Like, yes, that's the kind of policing I'd like to see in my community. Yes, I feel much safer now knowing that he's locked up. Is that sort of the, is that what we feel? Hey, we had A officers that are now in that community. Nobody knows anybody in that community. Nobody knows anybody on that block. Is that how we're comfortable? Is that what you guys feel? Is that like, oh yeah, I'm okay with that? Is that what we want to see? I got a comment in the back. Yes, sir. You feel what? You're offended by it. Anybody else offended by that? It was hard to watch. It was hard to watch. Okay. Yes. What was Well, it's a little bit about control. It's a little about so he wouldn't run, right? Remember in the Sandra Bland incident over in Brown, Texas, what did the officer, what triggered where he finally ended up pulling her out of the car? What was the, what was the, the key incident in the Sandra Bland where she was arrested over in Browns, Texas, and ended up hanging herself three days later. What was the incident that triggered that encounter? Besides, uh, she moved over because she thought he was trying to pull around her. But what, what exactly happened in that encounter with Sandra Bland? You guys remember? Wouldn't put out the cigarette. Man, put your cigarette out. Why? Okay, why? Well, because I said so. Okay, and that's what, that's what that boiled down to. Okay? Any other takeaways on, on the video? I mean, what... What, now, let me just disclose also, when, he, when it looks like he pushes, pushes his head down on, on the hood of the uh, car, it, we actually have a, have a dash cam. So I didn't show you GPD's dash cam. I just showed you the video that the young man posted after the incident. His, his, actually, his dreads hit the car. His head doesn't hit the car. So that's what makes the loud sort of popping noise. Uh, the, there was a complaint. The officer um, was investigated. Um, it was unsustained, you know, allegation. And so, you know, those things take a few months to get done. And we send a letter back to the victim saying, hey, you know, we thank you for complaining to us, but your, your case is unsustained. I'm not sure how you think that made the young man feel, but it was an unsustained complaint by the officers. Yes, sir. When I said that I was offended by it, you go after, the, after things escalate your way. I think that that's continued. My question is what started it and what selective enforcement there is. What is the incident of Black speeds. I know that I ride my bicycle at night. Right. Well, well, as a community, 
Right. So that's so that what, what initiated what's the, what's the genesis of the stop? Right. As a community, is that the sort of policing we like to see? Right. Well, it, absolutely. It just seems to me, and what what I, my takeaway is not necessarily the encounter. I got issues with the encounter, obviously, you know. But at the very end of it, when the officers show up and they don't know anybody in that neighborhood, I mean, you know, it's almost like this is a, a a Middle Eastern response in Kabul or something, you know. We're trying to keep the zone safe, and everybody back, you know. But the, but there is that sort of response, and that's where we have to. We don't seem to defuse the situation because it's escalating with that gentleman that's yelling that stuff. And my effort would have been. To de-escalate, de-escalate him and defuse it at least. Yes, sir. What we see in the video is offensive. My question is why, what precipitated it? Was this a high crime area? Uh, have they had a lot of burglaries, robberies lately? Did the officer have personal knowledge of this person? Uh, no. But, but you know, it's so fascinating because that's a great, great, great question because, you know, that's how we survive. He was asking me if there's not some uh, other uh, issues that maybe, maybe uh, contributed to the stop, like whether or not we had a bunch of robberies or burglaries or whether he knew the, the gentleman. So the gentleman was 16, no criminal history, never been arrested before. It was the first encounter with law enforcement. Okay, so, um, and, and no, it was a, in terms of high crime area, I mean, that's kind of hard to measure because most of our high crime areas that we're talking about, they don't call us. And they don't call us for service, okay, because they don't want the cops to show up at their house and all of a sudden now they're a snitch, you know, so there's their issues. So it's a very complicated. When some of these communities stop calling you, they become atomized. When you start looking at your dad and say, huh, everything's great at this housing project, nobody calls us. Well, they don't want you to show up. It's a number of reasons. They don't want the neighbor who's selling dope to see that cop walking up to your front door or, or their front door, okay? And maybe there's a legitimacy issue too. Maybe they don't view the cops legitimately. So. In terms of transparency and discussion, again, uh, I'm not, I, I take away from this really maybe the aftermath, you know, after it happened, there didn't seem to be much conversation, you know, even with the guy that was spouting off a lot of the anti-cop stuff, you know, the F-12 and stuff like that, who knows where 12 comes from? Anybody have a guess? I know you guys hear that all the time on the street. It was 5-0, Popo, 12 now. Probably from the 1-12 out of show originally, I guess, is where the origin of it. So that's a, that's a great point. A lot of factors, but that goes to the trust of the community. Sometimes when, when the young, when that, I, there's so many incidents to talk about, but I think in South Carolina, when, the, when that deputy kind of threw the girl across the room when he was trying to arrest her, I have a quick, just a picture of it in here, but it was interesting to me how the sheriff, who was actually in Chicago at the time at the ICP conference, I had to fly back. And, and what, what I think what he did right was that he went ahead and, did, and, and, and decided that, okay, Instead of collecting the facts, and that's usually what we're used to doing, I mean, as a, as a PBA president, I'm well aware of, hey, the, we don't have all the facts, and so where do all the facts come out? But sometimes the community's not ready to wait for all the facts to come out, you know? So sometimes we maybe need to expedite it. And the grand jury system, if we're waiting for a grand jury, like I like to tell my officers, we didn't create the grand jury. Cops did not create the grand jury. And that, we provide a lot of the material for the grand jury, but we didn't create it. Yes, ma'am. No, and that, that's part of the problem. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and, and not to mention, don't you think we would have got more as a cop working that neighborhood, neighborhoods that we work? You know, we would have got a lot more out of it. Hey, how you doing? How's your, how's your parents? What's your mom? Where are you living at, you know, in this neighborhood? And maybe made something positive out of that encounter. At the end of the day, when we look at how we used to measure cops back in my day, I was measured on my arrest and my, my tickets that I wrote. It's the only way I was really evaluated and not getting written up. Those were the three primary factors. But it's really hard to measure cops now on the community service, you know, that we're doing out there. And we're doing a ton of it, 
Okay, we are doing a ton of it. So I just wanted to start out because that's a GP, that's a Gainesville video, you know. So we we own that video. That's something that we've experienced. Uh, yeah, did we have a uh, sort of a, a backlash to that video? Absolutely. You know, or did we have a, a bunch of town hall meetings? That yeah, absolutely. Okay, but there's there's a, there's some positive that came out of that video. So I'm going to share that with everybody here as I, as I work my way through it. So the topics I'm going to cover today. By the way, we're going to run these till about 12 and then a quick lunch till 12.30 and then from 12.30 to 6, I'll finish up. Everybody okay with that? I've got about 490 videos or, or, or PowerPoint slides I want to share with everybody. Okay, so, um, no, uh, just reminds me. So an hour and a half, we'll probably take a break and then we'll do the second hour, hour and a half, try to get you guys out of here, out of here for lunch or, or whatever we're doing at 12 o'clock, okay? So... I have to drive back to Gainesville afterwards, so that'll be great. But some of the topics I want to cover today are DMC, uh, which is disproportionate minority content, which the judge mentioned, red, racial and ethnic disparity. I want to talk a little bit about procedural justice, a little bit about implicit bias. I could spend two days showing you that we have implicit biases and showing you a lot of studies about implicit biases, but I want to talk briefly about implicit biases and briefly about what we could possibly do to control maybe some of our own implicit biases. What works in Gainesville? Again, this is not necessarily a one-size-fits-all, may not work here. <clears throat> Police Youth Dialogue, we've been doing those for about three and a half years in Gainesville. I'll discuss that model with you. It's an it's a, it's a evidence-based model. It's very effective. And redefining our role, expectations. I think I mentioned that at the very beginning when I talked about, you know, at some point, you know, we're going to have to redefine our role, right, in terms of law enforcement. Maybe we don't, we're not warriors anymore. Maybe we have to become life coaches, uh, mentors, social workers. I mean, those are hard hard words that we don't necessarily, we didn't sign up for that stuff, you know? Back in my day, that's not what I signed up for. So, <clears throat> first thing I wanna talk about, has anybody ever heard of the term DMC? And now the judge has, <laughs> this morning. Is DMC, I know you've got the subcommittee working on DMC, is everybody in this room familiar with disproportionate minority contact? Okay. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about, uh, so there's the definition, you can find a number of definitions. This is from OJJDP. It refers to the disproportionate number of juvenile members of minority groups who come into contact with the juvenile justice system. Okay, this is not a criticism of law enforcement. Okay, when they look at your relative rate index numbers or look at your DMC numbers, they look at the entire system. They look at our first contact with the children once they get arrested, with the, with the youth once they go to, you know, uh, whether they're held for 21 days, uh, they look at whether they get put on probation, they look at uh, the curfews, which ones get diverted, they look which ones get sent off to the, the placement programs, and so your relative rate index is just not based on you know the gatekeepers, the officers, bless you. So it's just not based on, on just the officers making the arrest. So when you're looking at your relative rate index, and I'll show you some of that data here in a few minutes, you gotta look at all of it. So a couple of things with DMC, uh, what it means. It, it's really about looking at your numbers. So wh when I received a DMC, we actually got a DMC grant about four years ago at the Gainesville Police Department. And, and let me again digress. Okay, so my entire 30 years of law enforcement, I've been in detectives. I was a detective for 10 years. I worked as student murderers. I was a sergeant detective, lieutenant detective. And, and uh, then when I was a lieutenant detective, the chief came and said, hey, well, I want you to be the crime boss, crime czar, whatever you want to call it. So we have, once a week, we have ComStat. I'm sure you guys got some sort of ComStat. We call it tactical briefing. It's essentially once a week, cops on dots. What did we have the last seven days? What are we doing for the next seven days? Where do we want to deploy people, right? What are some of the issues coming up? Where are the big parties this weekend? You know, so those are, uh, University of Florida. So those are the discussions we have on a weekly basis. So I'm putting my presentation together, which I gave every week. I'm sharing an office with uh, Dr. Patricia Grunder, who was a, a, she was our mediator from the uh, Santa Fe Community College. We shared the same office. The chief kept walking in and telling Pat, Pat, you know, the DMC, you know, the DMC grant, how's it coming? Do we have this, that, and Pat. So finally I look up and I say, Chief, what, what does DMC, what does DMC mean? He says, well, disproportionate minority contact. And so, you know, I bristled and rolled my eyes. Ah, wow, okay, I get it. I said, so what you're saying is we're arresting too many blacks, and if we just arrested more whites, Chief, everything would be okay. And he's like, well, <laughs> well not really, you know. So that was sort of, I only say that in terms of my response because, when we, when we went through racial profiling 18 to 20 years ago, I think that was a little, a little bit of my response at the time as well. And I only share that with you because I think that's the lens that a lot of law enforcement looks through. And I only share that with you because, because that hurts. When someone tells you that you're treating people different because of their race, that hurts. It does. So I'm a human being, okay? 
I don't want to believe that that's what I do, okay? And I don't, in my heart, I don't feel like I am a racist. You know, I don't feel like anything I've ever done has, be, has been because of race. And so I'm just going to tell you that it's easy to cast aspersions on cops and, 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 and sort of define it as race, but it, but, but it hurts. It really does. And, and so, but recognizing that too, I also understood that, okay, Chief, well, what are we doing? He said, well, we need to look at our numbers, Will. We need to look at what we're doing. And I'm just like, okay, I'm good with that. Let's, let's, let's engage that. I know you have... Uh, and this circuit started down that path. In fact, I saw something here, Department of Juvenile Justice, Circuit 12, Comprehensive Plan. I pulled off the internet, which is pretty nice, but I circled a piece in the back here, found interesting. Goal, we plan to reduce DMC by one factor, one relative rate index point, over uh, years one through three. Good luck with that. <laughs> Good luck with that. Okay? I applaud you if you could do it. It's awfully ambitious, but at the end of the day, if you create any sort of policy or laws or, or ordinances that just help or benefit a particular race or gender, you can't do that. No, you can't do that. And so you got to fix the system. You got to look at everything. Okay? And so as you fix the system and arrest less kids in our schools or in our community, you're going to arrest less white kids. Okay? So your relative rate index is going to be very difficult, very difficult to impact. We're pioneers. 15 years will impact these rates. Right now, we just have to be smarter, right? Education, education, education. That's, that's the key. So I'll talk a little about negative and positive. Gainesville's got a lot of reason to have negative. Um, people look at DMC in, in, in Alachua County very negatively because, I say that because we have the second worst DMC numbers in the state of Florida. There are 67 counties, and we are the second worst. I think Miami-Dade beat us last year. So we were the worst in 13 and 14. But you've got to look at those numbers, and you've got to reach out for help and collaborations and grants and money and funding. That's, how, that's what you use those numbers for, okay? And there's a lot of kids, I mean, a lot of kids that you are going to help in the process. And so that's really got to be your goal. What does the EMC look like? When we first looked at some of our numbers, as you could tell, pretty consistent on some of the arrest of juveniles going back four years. I know I've got to update some of my data. I'll share my data with you as I talk through this presentation. So you're looking at, it might be a little bit to look at, but really that yellow line, can you see the yellow line? Okay, 88%. 88% of the kids we're arresting are African American. Population, demographics in Latcho County, 23% African American. We are number two in the state of Florida. <clears throat> So you want to unmask it a little bit and sort of how you, you say, and one of the things, and I'm not trying to sell it to the officers, but I will tell you, every Gainesville police officer knows what DMC is. Does it hurt them? Yes. Do they believe that maybe they're contributing to it? I don't know. I don't know. You know, so that's, that's uh, you know, cops, you know, we, we don't like change and we don't like when things stay the same either. Change is inevitable, you know, but growth for us is optional. All right, so that's how we got to really, it's got to be top down. If a lot of these efforts aren't driven from your sheriff, or your chief, then you're wasting your time, okay? I'm, I'm, I mean, there are some examples where you're not, but that's gotta be top, driven top down. So I talked about the overrepresentation. if you didn't already know that, so at least you'll come away from this discussion today understanding what DMC is. So originally it was called Disproportionate Minority Confinement back in 1992, which I was okay with, you know, because it didn't mean contact, Disproportionate Minority Contact, what is contact? Now they talk about key decision points, right? at every, every step of the juvenile justice system, but what is a contact, my officers? That's our term. Field contact, interview contact, that's us. So I thought, okay, now they've changed this thing towards law enforcement. Confinement, originally when they looked at nationally, over 70% of juveniles incarcerated are minorities, okay? In my county, and I believe in this county, your minorities are African American, okay? So in my metro day, they, got, uh, they look at things maybe a little, little differently in terms of some of their efforts. So in 1992, it became a core issue with OJJDP. Again, you talked about acronyms, Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, OJJDP. Which under the new president, not sure it's gonna be around much longer. We'll see. So I want a quick sort of dialogue here. What do you think contributes to DMC in your community? What is the impact? And again, I covered whether or not it was just law enforcement issues. What is contribute? If you had to think about DMC, especially my officers, what do you think contributes to disproportionate minority contact with, with, for example, what you guys experience here in Circuit 12 
or in Circuit 8 in Latchwood County? What are some of the contributing factors? Family. Themes. What's that? Family life. Family life. Excellent. What else? Poverty. 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 Good. What else? Family life. You mean like parents? Yeah. Parents? Okay. Bad parenting skills, maybe? Okay, what else? So poverty and family life. All right, some of you are still sleeping here today. Yes, ma'am. But are our cops in some of these crime areas, are we really fixing anything in that community? Are we making the kids smarter? I mean, we're we really making, you know, income disparity the same, health disparity the same, education disparity now the same in these communities that we're putting most of our officers in? I would challenge that. I really would, but I, but I agree with you, okay? But I would challenge that we're actually making those sort of changes. Sometimes we do. Sometimes we, we actually have some success stories. But overall, we're still dealing with the same families and the, the, the state attorneys and the public defenders know exactly who I'm talking about. When you're dealing with the same families in those same communities in those same neighborhoods year after year after year, it's, it look at it say, well, what are we really doing? What changes? It's a loop. 30 years ago, I policed these same government subsidized housing projects that we're still policing today. And we're expecting a different outcome, right? Because we have, really have to change our approach. And by that, when I talk about poverty, and I'll throw out a few more, since I know you guys are just holding back on me, education, opportunity, jobs, employment. Now, there's a bunch of reasons, a bunch of disparity issues that we as officers and that we in this business have inherited. So the, uh, it's come out as crime. But at the end of the day, when you're talking about a lot of your disparities that you have in these communities, they've got nothing to do with, cr with criminal behavior. At the end of the day, when all these disparities come together, it does look like criminal behavior, and that's how we define those kids and that action and those parents as criminal behavior. Because what we've inherited, and I didn't understand this, I went to more diversity training, I went to more affirmative action training, discrimination training, I didn't understand what I was being trained on. I just knew I didn't want to be there, okay? I knew I didn't want to be there until I really understood what exactly was happening with, with uh, what was happening and why I was seeing what I was seeing. And I'm going to get to that point and I'll elaborate on a minute. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the evolution of policing strategies. Again, I'm talking about law enforcement. That's the kind of lens I'm familiar with. So I'll talk a little bit about some of the community policing efforts. In the late 80s to the 90s, we embraced uh, some of the policing models. Uh, zero tolerances, war on drugs, broken window, three strikes. Everyone probably should be a little familiar with some of these. Broken window, I think they sort of tossed that back in New York's face. I think after the Eric Garner arrest where he was killed because he wasn't complying, but he, they, they wrestled him to the ground, he couldn't breathe, he was selling cigarettes on the side of the road. But the idea behind broken window is you want to fix the graffiti and the broken windows, that way other folks won't be enticed to bring in drugs and everything else. So it's really at the, but at the end of the day, they were really just policing the, the, some of your poor populations with kids with less opportunity, right? Some of your more cha economically challenged neighborhoods, that's in the, who they were policing. And so now you're starting to see the, the sort of the backlash again on some of those efforts. I want to say it here real quickly in case I forget, but a lot of what we see on the media over the last, prior to this election, I get it, now you can't see any news, but prior to this election, a lot of the, 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 the law enforcement rhetoric, a lot of the, um, the black community rhetoric in some of these bigger cities, when you, had, when you had Freddie Gray in Baltimore, okay, when he was, people weren't angry about Freddie Gray. They were angry about all the disparities that they've been experiencing for the last hundred years. And that's what you have to understand. That's what they were really fighting against. And so that, that just triggered that incident. That triggered that moment where all of a sudden the community said, hey, we've had enough. And so there's something to, to understand when you, when you go through and understand our role in law enforcement as to what, what does the community expect? You know, what do they want? Because we will spend all day telling you to come to our academy, come walk in our shoes, come do a ride along. We'll provide you all sorts of reasons why we do what we do. At the end of the day, you have to tell us what you want to see. And until you do that, it will not change, okay? Because we're going to continue to show you what we do, why we do it, okay? That's, what, that's just the way we've been doing things for a lot of years. So the invitation, you know, when I talk to my groups in my community, I'm begging it. Tell us what you want to see, what you want us to do differently. Participate in our training. 
There's nothing that we train about that you all can't see unless it's maybe your SWAT team doing an entry on a school or something. I mean, there's some stuff that we don't want you to know about, but by and large, 90% of it, come, come watch what we do. You know, give us your feedback. You know, let us know if you like traffic stops. Defensive tactics, okay? We do a lot of that kind of stuff. Post 9-11, so we kind of went, we, we militarized. We, we, got, we have a lot of equipment from the military. Funny story, right after uh, Ferguson, there was a big criticism in Ferguson about um, the optics. A big criticism about, you know, when the National Guard came in and surrounded the, the police building, was one of the things that they did because they didn't have binoculars. They were all looking through their scopes, right? And the optics just didn't look good. They didn't look good. They brought in the MRAPs, they brought in all the equipment. Um, the officer, you know, you guys, if you saw the visual optics, you were like, man, this is America. You know, you're starting to question, really, this is what's happening. So that set us back. It's ironic because we bought, we bought an MRAP that same week in Texas. It was a $600,000 uh, steel vehicle to withstand IEDs and everything else. And we were shipping it over to Gainesville that week when this militarization issue came up. And, I was, and we bought it for 2300 bucks. And I was telling the chief, stop, pull, pull over. Don't bring this thing home. We don't need this. We don't need this. And you got to be smart and understand what your community is going to expect from you. And of course, no, nope, they brought it. And boy, we, we took heck for it, you know, for bringing that thing in. We had all these groups, military groups, all these prior military folks. How many military, prior military uh, folks do I have in here? Excellent, excellent. Uh, they're the first ones that came and said, you don't need that in this community. You don't need that. That's what, you know, so it was, I had never seen these groups come in before. But it's since we kind of worked our way through it, uh, been some follow-up on it. You know, it's been parked. It's got cobwebs and bird nests and everything else on it right now. But, but it's still available if we need it, I can tell you right now. But it's just about understanding the optics. You know, and, 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 and compare what happened in Ferguson with what happened in San Bernardino. Okay, when those two terrorists, when they were using the bobcap and the MRAP to pinch in that SUV, taking out the two terrorists. And when that officer, and I'm sorry, I get goosebumps, when he told those people, you know, we're in that conference, hey, just follow me, I'll, I'll take the first bullet. You know, so I mean, I mean that's, we, we won those optics. We had our automatic weapons out, everybody did, right? We just did fascinating stuff, and that's, that's, a, that's a piece of it that's great. You know, a couple of the officers had maybe had a little bit of issue with that young man videotaping. Man, we got to get over that. I mean, we, we dealt with that post 9-11, and we kept telling them, we got to put that camera down. You can't videotape me. I'm like, really? That's what we used to tell people. You know, we used to tell people, okay, now you just expect to get video. We're going to win that optic battle, okay? I'm not opposed to body cams or dash cams or anything else, only that I don't really understand how they work. I don't understand how to record them, okay? I'm not opposed to that stuff because I think law enforcement will win those optics, okay, eventually. We're just having going through a learning curve now with a lot of that stuff. And as a union rep, you know, anytime they're asking us to do something additional, I'm always, okay, well, how much additional money are we going to get for that? You know, because I'm a big believer. You know, you want us to stay in shape? Well, how much? So it's a negotiation. So a lot of these, what you're demanding on your chief and what you're demanding on your sheriff has to be negotiated. Okay? So just understand it takes a little while as well. Uh, 1033 programs, that's the organization that provides us with a lot of the equipment that we use. Uh, Post Sanford, Ferguson, New York, Baltimore. Carolina has always come up. I'm not sure why. Texas, and there are issues over there. So when I talked a little bit about what contributes to DMC, I, I mean, I really would, again, I'm not an expert. I'm not a lecture. I don't lecture on a history. But if you really looked at where we evolved from, right, we weren't really mentioned in the Bill of Rights or the Constitution, like, all right, let's have police departments. In fact, if our founding fathers knew what we do now with our SWAT team, roll over in their graves, right? I mean, because of the Castle Doctrine and everything else, I mean, those are some things to understand how we evolved. Now, how did the South evolve? You know, we essentially went out and recovered runaway slaves. That's how we evolved. And I get it, it was Sir Robert Peel in Boston and New York and some other pieces of it as well. But in the South, Alachua County, we've had more lynchings in Alachua County than the entire South. We led the country in lynchings, you know. But we have to understand the history of where we've come from. And what we're seeing, if everybody thinks, you know, post-1865 was when everything became great and fair and equitable, you're wrong. You're wrong. You know, after World War II, there was 500,000 black troops that didn't get FHA loans, that didn't have houses that your parents currently have paid off, and they're going to be left in your will to you. 
So there was a lot of, it wasn't really till maybe even 1965, but you know, out of what happened, you know, in the late 1800s, all of a sudden you had the Ku Klux Klan, you had the Jim Crow laws, the black codes, okay? They're all designed to keep beggars off the street, all designed to keep people from sleeping under bridges. But who were they designed for? The rich people or the poor people? The poor people. Okay, so understand what we've inherited. It's not a finger pointing. No one's blaming anybody for what we're, where we've come from. And these nightsticks, these PR24s in my day, man, they just don't look good. When you're trying to get compliance and, you know, stand down, stand down, and striking somebody in the comment. Who do I have trainers in here? You trainers? Common peroneal, you got to hit. It just doesn't look, this just doesn't look good. I'm just telling you. I'm glad we got the tasers. I really am. You know, I think the tasers really sort of even out, you know, the optics. I mean, you're just not going to get Rodney King. And I'm convinced Los Angeles just believed that if they kept beating him because of the training they got and tasing him, that he was going to comply. At the end of the day, we got to get in the dirt on the ground. You know, we got to roll around. None of my training included rolling around in my day. That's where we have to, we got to do that, you know. So we've incorporated some of that training, I think, into some of our curriculum. I know you guys probably have as well. You know, a lot of our stuff that we trained with originally was all standing up, you know, jujitsu kind of stuff, you know. Hit them in the throat, things. I don't know. No, nothing ever worked for me. So we've, we've, we've kind of moved forward, you know. Um, we had an incident in Gainesville where the, where the canine officer released his, where he responded to a burglary in progress, and there was a 10-year-old African-American that saw the officer jump out, jump out with the dog, and he took off back to his house. Boop, the officer released the dog. So if you don't think that that doesn't resonate negatively in some of your black communities, you're wrong. A dog biting an African-American. I mean, there's a history to this that we have to understand and the optic to it. Okay, I understand the importance of canines, but you've got to understand also how negatively sometimes some communities view them. So again, I talked a little bit about the one at the bottom, the South Carolina uh, deputy that, that threw the young lady across the room because she wouldn't, I forgot, turn her cell phone off, give the cell phone, and it wasn't the incident. The teacher ended up calling her, calling the officer, I'm sorry, into the room to get her to comply. All right, so what at the bottom one, first of all, if you guys remember that video, it was on for a while. Everybody showed it before the election. Um, what, what was really, did anybody remember the scene, that video? with the, the South Carolina uh, SRO, and he lost his job, okay, the one at the bottom. He lost his job over that incident. Now, we didn't know all the facts, right? That was one thing we always say. We're currently collecting all the facts, you know. So they didn't know the job. So he, but what was, how could we have avoided this, this situation at the bottom where the teacher calls the officer? How could we have avoided that? Anybody got some suggestions? Teacher should have handled it. That means so much, what you just said. The teacher should have handled it. Okay, that, you know what that means? That means the community needs to handle a lot of what we get called to do. It's not our job. That's not our job. I'll be honest, that's not our job. We gotta stop, we gotta stop doing that. You need policy to support you, that's not your job. You can show up, make the environment safe, make referrals, make recommendations, that's not our job. Thank you. Anybody else? Excellent. Love it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Most of this stuff, because I think three or four years ago, we've had five championships in Gainesville. Five. Right? Every single one of them, the kids come out at 1 o'clock in the morning, they take over the roads, they take over university, take over 13th Street. 20,000 students come out. Now, are we all lined up in our field equipment and, and our, and no, no. We're sitting there getting hugs and kisses, and the students are coming out, okay, because now Arizona, uh, uh, over in Arizona, they had a similar incident of, uh, a few years ago where they had their SWAT team or their field force team lined up, but the students found them. They were, the intent wasn't to go out there in the street, but they found them. Man, they went after them. Shoot me with those rubber bullets, you know, and man, all of a sudden, they had to do, use uh, tear gas and everything else because you're exactly right. You know, all of a sudden, you're de-escalating. You know, you're not coming in with all this brute force, you know. Um, great couple of points. Okay, so the, the, the young man on the top, uh, if you actually listen to the video, the deputy says some really good things to him. He just, the cuffs wouldn't fit him. This is not an unusual situation. It's not in their policy that they can't do it. I think the chief put it in their policy. 
well, after that incident. But um, again, it's the optics. The community doesn't want to see this. Okay? We're the experts. We're trained. Hostage negotiators. Verbal judo. I mean, we, we know what to, we have all the equipment. We're trained in this stuff. And that's the expectation where they're redefining our role. I, I, I get the child should have complied. I get that part. You know, well, if the, the, the traffic stop would have just listened to me and done what I said. Well, things have changed, and things are changing. What changes can we expect from some of the DMC efforts? We'll strengthen, promote better communication with the neighborhoods that we serve and protect. And, and just to, to say that, I, I hear this a lot, especially from my NAACP folks, that if they just had more black officers, in those communities. There's more black officers. Now I'm a big advocate of minority officers and females are minorities in law enforcement. We do not have enough females. We just can't seem to, to hire the minorities. When I started back in 84, I worked with the first African American female at the Gainesville Police Department. 1984, are you kidding me? I worked with her for seven years. She was a detective, right? I didn't, we didn't, again, like I said, I didn't see the race thing, but I'm just, as I look back, I'm thinking, 30 years ago, we hired our first female black officer? you got to be kidding me. So that just tells you how far we have to go. You know, it just tells you how young we are. Yes, ma'am? I'm the first black lady on your side. First what? I'm the first black female deputy from Manatee County. Round of applause. Round of applause. Right. Thank you. Thank you for illustrating my point. I mean, I, I just didn't get it. Um, well, back to my point in WCP. So they want, you know, but, but I'm telling you, I am telling you, and you probably agree with this too. Now, I get your command staff has to represent your community. I have no qualms or issues about that at all. But until you see minorities in those positions, you know, really, what is the incentive of the drive for folks to sign up to be a cop if you're a minority? Okay, and that's what you're. That's the first thing they're going to measure you on. Number one, DOJ, ICP, Noble. Anybody comes in and looks at you, first thing they want to see. Well, let me look at your demographics. That's chapter one. Everybody, get it right. Right? Get those demographics right. But back to my point. You don't have to be black to serve in a black community. You can be white, but if people trust you and you care, you'll be just as effective as a black person. You'll just be effective as a, as a female. You can be effective, okay? And so understand, don't, don't think that's a disadvantage just because you're white working in a predominantly uh, African-American or economically challenged neighborhood, whatever those happen to be in your community. You can be effective, okay? So. I get that, that they, that's what they, a lot of folks, and you know, we always have that discussion, but I'm just going to give you my point. I'm not saying I'm right. I'm just saying that that's, that's my experience, and that's, that's, that's my point. Um, better communication skills. Again, I talked about a little bit about the training. Provide supervisors and officers with more discretion when facing a response that they believe merits more attention than just arresting someone. There are consequences when we arrest somebody. There's consequences. I love my cops. I'm also asking my cops, my cops in here, who has kids? Cops, cops, who, cops who have kids? Any teenagers? Okay, one of them now all of a sudden steals from Walmart. You want to see him arrested? They should know better, right? Who am I getting a, an up and down head? I'm not putting anyone on a spot here. I'm just saying, typically, when I'm talking to 40 or 50 cops, yes, well, my child knows better. If they steal from Walmart, they should be arrested, right? And I'm always throwing that back at them. Well, let me, let me get this straight. So you want your child arrested, let's say it's domestic, let's say it's for maybe fighting your wife or fighting you or something, right? Now they got to go to first appearance, right? Now all of a sudden, maybe a JPO gets assigned or maybe a judge tells them they got to stay in school, they got to be home by seven, you know, you can't have any alcohol in your house. I mean, at what point do you want cops to come raise your kids for you? What point do I have to keep showing up and taking your child to school, okay? You want to handle it. That's what I'm asking. I'm telling you, you want to handle it. You know, as a parent. Now, there are some parents that don't maybe know how to handle it as well, but I guarantee you do, okay? And that's what, that needs to be your job. Because, so, this, uh, so again, when I talk about, and again, when you get a bunch of cops in a room, it's pretty much who could be the toughest parent competition. Oh, yeah, send my kid off, you know? And get, you know so they're just saying that because other cops in the room and seeing them. And I get that. I get that with the kids, too, that I work with. <clears throat> um, so we want to, um, more discretion. Now, m discretion is kind of a slippery slope. I want discretion. You start out with discretion. You start out with training, all right? Then you start out with um, education. And then you start out with a little discretion. And you see how it works. And you say, okay, are the officers making the decisions that I want them to make? That's where discretion works. And then you back it up two or three years later, policy. 
That's how you do it, man. It's a slow cycle, but it's got to be done. Because we, we work off policy. That's what we work off. Because we don't want to get written up, right? And we, we are regulated, you know, by we have our own internal affairs. Uh, we have the state attorney, FDLE. Everybody looks at everything that we do. So we're, we're heavily regulated. We don't want to make mistakes because we love our jobs. Okay? We love our jobs. So I'll talk a little bit more about discretion. Hiring promotions transfer influence. So if you want to make a lot of these decisions that, that some of the officers make, and again, you can apply this to DJJ and everybody else, then make it part of hiring, make it part of the promotions. You're, oh, you want to transfer it to detectives? Okay, you know, what have you done for the community lately? I mean, challenge your officers, you know? Put, put that in, in their goals, you know, and put that in their evaluations. So it can be done. It's just a, it's a, a little more moving piece, a little more organic in terms of how to measure your officers, but make that part of your mission statements. Okay, so again, this is something I had added. So just real quickly, if, you, if you're not familiar with this, DJJ, uh, DJJ does a really good job at collecting a lot of the data that they look at. Again, with any data, you know, there are outliers, there are reasons that we have the data. And so I'm not, you know, you want to look at the data just to kind of see how you're doing and then make some adjustments. Is everybody familiar with this DJJ research, research site? Everybody familiar with it? I know you folks are. Okay, I should... <coughs> So anyways, if you have a chance, I want you guys to, to look at it. And you can pull out, so I, I circled the research piece of it for you. Pull that up, and within that, you've got delinquency in schools, disproportionate minority contact, which measures your county, and um, uh, the, the delinquency in school will actually measure your, the, the schools individually as well. So, and then at the bottom is the civil citation dashboard. I know I talked to Jenny. Thank you, Jenny Donovan, for inviting me. I didn't, didn't mention that. Thank you very much. I've talked to Jenny a little bit about, you know, some consistency with your civil citations. Because I'm a big advocate for civil citations. Okay, I never understood why. I never, I never issued a civil citation in my 30 years. But now that I reflect back on it, I'm thinking, man, pretty good program. So our teen court is where, where everybody by default goes if they get issued a civil citation. So obviously your teen court is really not designed for 10-year-olds and probably some of the older ones too. So you've got to really see what, what works. And everything's got to be measured. Every six months, I like what you guys do. Look at your data. So always, if you don't have a chance to get into this DJJ site, go through it. You can pull it up by agency, city, circuit. Notice I'm avoiding the circuit for our circuit. So I wanted to just to share with you uh, disproportionate minority contact, racial ethnic disparity. Red came out a few years ago. It used to be just DMC. But red really represents, are you treating people differently because of their race? Right? So that's how I distinguish the two in my mind. DMC is looking at your numbers. Now red is, are you treating people differently because? Now, your numbers will show that you are. Now, that, again, goes back to what? No way. No, that hurts. I don't treat people differently because they're African American. So I wanted to illustrate number two in the state out of how many counties? 67? So again, what they measure, they measure your age 10 to 17. Um, so our demographics from 10 to 17, so we don't have those uh, younger than 10, so they're looking at 29%. But of the kids that we're arresting, 76% are African American. 76%. And again, it's cliche, you know, the, the deeper you go, the darker it gets. I've heard that one before as well. Secure detention, I think we're up to 82.5%. Okay? This is what got us the grant, this, these numbers. And this, these are the most recent numbers. This is, 14, this is after all of our efforts. So, relative rate index in DMC is a unicorn. Okay? Don't all of a sudden get discouraged and disappointed because of this. All right? Just understand the numbers, the real numbers, what you're, where you're actually having the biggest impact. Okay? This is a measuring stick. It's a tool. But use that, again, to either to your advantage or to readjust as to what you're doing. Because I'm going to show you some, some interesting data that's, that's within this data that I think is pretty remarkable. Uh, okay? So just, just bear with me a few minutes. And uh, I think I pulled up Sarasota County. Um, I know I've got Manatee and DeSoto County here as well. So their relative rate index is uh, 4.2, and they're number 15, worse, out of 67. So it looks like they've got 9.3% uh, uh, black, but of the kids they're arresting, 32% of the kids they're arresting, overall kids are black. So there's a DMC relative rate index number that you would want to look at. You know, that's one of the numbers that you, that you want to look at. But again, within this data, it's not overly accurate entirely, but, but use this as sort of a starting point.
and I'm looking down. So 36% are in the secured attention. But this also measures your diversions. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I apologize for the state attorney and folks here, but I can't control who and what you divert. So my goal is to make sure you don't get cases. Right? When I talked about putting you out of work, my goal is to make sure that child does all of a sudden isn't becoming a decision, key decision point for you. Okay? So I'm into diversions. I'm into civil citations. Okay, I'm into you guys, Jay Dapping and civil citation, Team Cornell, the kids you want to, but at the same time, my goal is to change the gatekeepers. You know, I want to see what we have. It's, it's a gap. When I talk about 95 civil citation statute that covers civil citations, we still have a lot of discretion to do some things without putting a child through the civil citation process as well. So, so understand. And I, I, you know, this, this, I hear this all the time too. Well, if people want, don't want us to arrest, then they should change the laws, should take them off the books. No, we have the discretion not to arrest. The state attorney has the discretion when to advocate for somebody to go to prison or probation. Okay, we're protected. The judge has the discretion too in terms of his ability to make a decision. Okay, you think just because a state attorney puts somebody on probation and now that probation he goes out and commits another offense or kills somebody, that they can now sue the state attorney because of her decision? No, we are protected by the same discretion ability. Okay, implicit bias. Who's ever heard of implicit bias? A few of you, okay, explicit bias. I stopped that car because the driver is black, right? Is that against your policy? Against your policy? Is that explicit bias? Yeah, I express myself, right? Implicit bias, implicit. It's a bias that we all have that's unconscious, that was developed through years of our, our and then I pushed the wrong button, but through years of uh, our, our religion, um, it's uh, through uh, social media, it's uh, who our friends are, it's uh, maybe our political affiliation. So there's a lot of things that influence our implicit bias. Okay, and we all have it. We have it. There's stereotypes. That's what they are. They're subconscious stereotypes that we all have, and we all, they all come out. I, I can think of back when they came out all the time when I was a rookie working in, in the streets of, in some of these projects in Gainesville. You know? I remember thinking to myself, wow, can't believe people live like this. I guess they're used to being arrested, you know? They don't care. It's an implicit bias. All police officers, judges, JPO, state attorneys are human. We all have implicit biases. It comes from our upbringing, education, religion, social media. I think I mentioned that. I put this in light blue. I, I, you, I'm glad you guys can see it. I can hardly see it on my screen here. Um, so it actually, when does it come out? It shows itself under stress. Stress of that implicit bias will come out. Now, it's really difficult for police departments to really regulate implicit bias. They can regulate explicit bias. That's easy. I just gave you an example. Okay, well, you can't do that anymore. It's against policy, you know, two days salary or five days suspension, whatever, you know, the punishment. But implicit bias is very interesting. In fact, if you look at it, there's a lot of studies out there that show you that we all have implicit bias. And there's two days worth of Dr. Lori Friedel presenting, if you haven't had her presentation, it's fascinating, but as to, as to that we all have implicit biases. There's a Harvard implicit bias test you guys can take online. It's real quick. It takes about 15 minutes. I took it. I failed it, okay? I can tell you, look at it. And, and so there are, so understanding that we all have implicit bias, I think what's important is to understand what it really means. And I can tell you what it means because how I deal with it, I will kind of laugh at myself sometimes. Like, well, that's, that's your implicit bias. That's what, that's what it is, and I think if you recognize that, I think you'll have a better time understanding and dealing with it. What happens when we get dispatched to a call, whether it's on the call screen or whether the dispatcher is telling us the information, we fill in the rest of that stuff with what? Our implicit biases, because that call, call screen doesn't give us all the facts. In fact, half the time it gives us hardly anything. We're always asking for more information. So we start to fill in our implicit bias, right? That's what we do, and so we already make conclusions. Now, that's also an officer's safety issue as well. So we start to fill in. You know, I'm familiar with that house. I wonder who else is there, you know? I'm a little bit of a golfer. Robert Lipsky was golfing the other day. He's Japanese. I just caught me off guard. What, really? Japanese. God, and I never heard of the guy. But my implicit bias when I saw his name on the leaderboard was, huh. I don't know, I've never heard of him before. Here's the problem with implicit bias in law enforcement. Besides your own implicit biases, 
you now have inherited everybody else's implicit biases. So when that elderly lady calls you because she's living on a, 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 a more, not ecumen, I don't know your neighborhoods in here, okay, let's say living on, maybe on the beach or something. She's out there in her community, her gated community, not being critical, gated, my community's gated as well. She calls, hey, there's two black guys, black kids walking in my neighborhood. I've never seen them before. Two black kids walking. How many, how many often do we get that kind of call? Whether it's children or somebody else that they've never seen before. So now we have just inherited what? Her implicit biases. Because how you handle that call is going to have a big impact on the chief and the sheriff and you and everybody else, internal affairs, right? Because back in my day, we didn't have a problem with that. It was a typical question. Uh, excuse me, I need to talk to you. Yes, uh, do you live here? Where are you going? Where are you coming from? Who are your parents? Okay. Now, I'm just telling you right now, things have changed. Okay. We, you really, officer safety is a key. Okay, but not everybody's trying to kill you. I mean, I tell the cops all the time. But they don't see the landmines that we see. We have landmines. They don't see them. So you have inherited implicit biases from people that call you and say, hey, there's a, there's a situation, incident. And I get that, okay, but understand, you know, how we train our officers, too. Because, uh, you know, most, most kids, I mean, you know, really, if you, hey, I need to talk to you. I mean, if you see a black kid in a white neighborhood, maybe you're thinking, okay, there might be a burglary issue going on here. Maybe you got burglary stats, like you talked about before. You see a white kid in a predominantly black neighborhood, maybe you're thinking he's buying dope, right? So you, you can flip that as well. So there's a lot of reasons to understand. And my suggestion to you officers, your sergeants, your chief, your lieutenants, Get out of your car, walk up, shake their hands. I'm Officer Will, here's my car, glad to meet you. They know you're there, you've had a positive encounter, maybe the parents will call you. Because how many times do parents say, an officer stopped my child? I wanna know what officer that was. And we spend the next two hours trying to figure out, all right, who stopped that child? So your policy, if you make a citizen encounter, give your card, give me your card. Because then they'll know, hey, Officer Mike or Officer, you know, whoever stopped, stop me. So that, that, I just want to really just touch on the fact that, you know, as officers and as, and as call takers, your dispatch unit, you've inherited other people's implicit biases. Let's go through this uh, quickly. Um, again, shaped by stereotypes, attitudes, fears, feelings, perceptions. And, and again, somebody's perception is your reality. Okay, so you have to understand it. You may not believe, you may buy into it. You may scoff or bristle at what somebody says. But what they believe is your reality. When members in our police youth dialogue talk about they believe cops kill blacks, they believe that. Okay? And they kill them because they're black. So I'm not saying don't argue with them. I mean, you just need to understand those are how strong some of the feelings are when you're having your discussions. Again, the biases come out without a permission and affect our judgment without our awareness. SWAT guys in here? SWAT guys? SWAT. Somebody SWAT? Anybody want to be on a SWAT team? <laughs> all right, so, but, okay, so our patrol guys, I'm with you. All right, guys, I need a SWAT team out here. Okay, I got to call them all, they come out four hours later, right? Not when I really needed them. And what's the first thing they do? Slow things down. I said, man, things have been slow for four hours, you know? And you just go get that guy out of the house or something. You know, that's the first thing they do. So an implicit bias when you're all of a sudden feeling distressed, really just kind of slow things down a little bit. So this is just a slide. I actually made this slide for my officers when I show it to them. What do, you, what do your instincts tell you about these cars? Instincts. Huh? Drug dealer? What else? Where are my cops? Gangs. Uh, unsafe. Equipment violations? That's what I see. I've never written a ticket in my, life, my career. Don't hold it against me. Ticket violations, gangs, right? You see an, an elderly Asian lady driving that car? Possibly. African American Hispanic driver. Yep. Loud stereo. That's what I see. It screams at me. Boom, boom, boom. Drug dealer, equipment violation. Oh, uh, and then, okay, so real quickly, so um, I have another slide on there too, and I might have put it in a different spot, but it's a truck with a rebel flag on it. And what do you see with that? And uh, the officer, when you see a, a four wheel drive with a rebel flag, what's, what do your hair stand up in the back of your neck tell you about that vehicle? gun in it. If not a gun, it's a what? If it's not a gun, it's a what? It's an axe handle, right? Hanging in the back, right? So I always ask my officers, do you think there's an African-American lady driving that car? No. 
All right, so procedural justice, Chicago style. I only throw this out to you because anytime you mention Chicago, you're like, whoo, man, they're doing everything wrong in Chicago. Um, well, they are doing some things wrong. Yeah, I agree. But they're also doing a lot of things great in Chicago, okay? And they're always on the news, I think, by, by a lot of the, the murders you're having in some of their um, African-American communities and stuff like that. But they actually, if you all remember the, uh, so I'm going to touch on procedural justice right here, so I'm kind of segueing into it. But if you remember the Laquan McDonald shooting, uh, that was in, uh, was held back a year. They finally released the video. It was a young man that had mental health issues that had the little knife on him that was walking down the street. And the video showed that he kind of was starting to peel away from Officer Van Dyke, I think. And the officer shoots him 16 times. You guys remember that? I don't know if he hits him 16 times, but he unloaded his magazine. So after that incident, I call up my folks in Chicago. I said, Chicago is going to burn. I said, Chicago, I'm telling you, I've seen it. They're going to burn down. No, no, Will. Believe it or not, we have a lot of good relationships. We do a lot of it with our faith based. There's a lot of positive stuff. And if you recall, Dream Defenders, Black Lives Matter, Justice League, and I can't remember who it was, but they did boycott some of the stores or protest um, some of the stores at Christmas time because this was released right before Christmas. But they didn't really have any rioting. And if you recall from that incident, you're thinking to yourself, hmm, yeah, they didn't really have much rioting going on. Now, he attributes it again to some of the relationship building that they've done in their community, some of the deposits they've made. Okay, now I only say that because we only see the surface stuff. All right, so back to procedural justice. So it was, it's a curriculum that was really designed to address some of the exact issues that we saw on that first traffic stop when everybody came into the room. Okay, it's designed to treat people with dignity and respect. Okay, and to be transparent. Why did you, why did you stop me? Well, man, this is why I stopped you. Okay, and to give everybody a voice. And so that's the, and, and, and to create police legitimacy. Because if you're not legitimate, the community's not going to listen to you. They're not going to respect you. And people in Chicago are dying over lack of respect. When we talk about respect, and the kids throw it around all the time, sometimes that's all people have left by the time we've stripped their entire youth, by the time we've stripped everything else away from them, by the time we did the three strikes, you're out, zero tolerance. There's nothing left they have but their dignity and respect. That's all they got. So give it to them. Give it to them. So, they, uh, so my Chicago folks, uh, again, uh, through Yale University, working with uh, Tom Tyler and Tracy Mears, you all can find us online if you'd like, um, they developed this curriculum that they kind of rolled out in Chicago over the last couple of years. So they have an entire training unit that talks to the officers about procedural justice and about how to treat people. Now, we all, I think at some point within our policies, have some definitions in there, some chapters in there about how to treat people, okay? But quite frankly, it's very difficult to put all that in policy. It's very difficult, you know, you don't roll your eyes, don't frow your brows, you know, don't, your voice inflection needs to be at a particular pitch. We, can't, we just know what we want to see, but we don't want a policy that's that thick telling us what we want to see. So procedural justice is, is sort of comes in and says, hey, this is a training model that you may want to roll out to your officers and sort of try to embed that in some of your mission statements because I'll talk to you, this is not a policy. Procedural justice is not a policy. It's about how you want your officers to, tr to treat the community folks and also about how you want your command staff to treat the officers. Because if you're not practicing procedural justice within your own agency, and it could be DJJ, it could be nationwide, it could be anywhere else, then you're wasting your time, try, time trying to get everybody else to, to practice procedural justice. So the four fundamentals, we talk about voice, neutrality, respect, fairness, and transparency. If the public ceases to view its justice system as legitimate, consequences ensue. People are more likely to comply with the law and cooperate with law enforcement efforts when they feel the system and its actors are legitimate. What did I just say? It's a mouthful. What I'm telling you is that people care more about how they're treated and care more about the process than they do about the outcome. They may not, okay, yeah, the ticket hurts, yeah, the arrest hurts. They care about how they're treated. This defies any sort of study we've ever done. People care about the end result. No, they care about how they're treated. They care about the, how they're treated when they face a judge in court. They care about how they're treated. So we need to understand that it's an officer safety issue. People care about how they're treated, okay? They may end up with a ticket, they end up getting arrested. But you can still have fantastic relationships with those people, you know? So as cops, my cop buddies, how many have been pulled over driving your personal car or your, I had a detective car for 30 hours, I got pulled, I've been pulled over at least 16 times, just so you know, I lost count. Officers ever been pulled over? 
personal cars? No? Yes? Possibly? Yes? I get pulled over in Gainesville, so I know the traffic unit. You know, I pull over at dark tinted windows. Damn it, Alvosa. You know, you again. So it's, it's kind of interesting, but when I get pulled over, what I always get, I always get the attitude from the officers. And I deserve it, I guess, to some extent, because I'm a cop too. Kind of hypocritical of me speeding, right? I get that. But I don't get the ticket. So sometimes our community gets what you saw in that first video. They get the attitude and they get the ticket and the arrest, right? You know, yeah, take that with you, you know? So just to understand, people really do care more about how they're treated and they care about the process, right? And less about the outcome. And that's really the whole premise behind legitimacy. When you're talking about legitimacy, that's how your community needs to view you. And I talked a little bit about, about the history and the origin and where we evolved from. Because we have to start working on our, on our legitimacy now, okay? Now. Procedural justice promotes the idea that how individuals regard the justice system is tied more to the perceived fairness of the process and how they are treated. So when you use the four pillars that I mentioned, taking the ego out of policing too, when you are, you, when you give folks a voice, you know, when you are transparent, when you are respectful and show them some dignity, okay, and trustworthy, okay, you're going to see a much more positive relationship, I think, your, your officers and the community and your JPOs and the community as well. So again, uh, you've got three, four days of procedural justice training, which, I, which I'm condensing here in about five minutes. Okay, again, I mentioned it's not a policy, it's a core value. You know, it's, uh, it's not one size fits all. It's, it, understand that it's not the environment, it's, it, you have to understand the environment that you did not create. And I think I mentioned that at the beginning in some of my opening statements on what we've inherited in law enforcement. People are more concerned about the process than the ticket or the arrest. And the four pillars that, uh, again, there's also uh, uh, out of Washington, Susan Raw has a lead, L-E-E-D, listen, explain, equity, dignity. I mean, that's kind of the same sort of principles if you kind of know where I'm headed on this. And they've been very effective. Treat people with dignity and respect. Be mindful of the tone of voice during encounters, but you want to give them a voice too, right? Did they, the officer really give Sandra Bland a voice? Not really. Once she, he, she gave him the voice that he didn't want to hear, you know, he resorted to the handcuffs. That's what happened. Remain neutral in decision making. Convey trustworthy, mo trustworthy motives. What's interesting about this neutral, and I, I'll give you guys an example later, you know, some of our efforts. So, again, Susan Raw really embraces it. She runs the academy out there now in Washington, the state of Washington. Uh, it turns out people don't care <clears throat> as much about crime rates as they do about how they are treated by the police. Don't misunderstand. We are not advocating a reduction in tactical training or equipment. That's a good, good point. I've never once said, hey, we need less shooting. We need less active shooter. We need less defensive tactics. We need less driving training. I'm not saying that, but we can do both, okay? No one's asking us to give up anything in terms of our training, what we train for now. But within that training should be procedural justice. Within that training, we should understand what people want to see and how to treat them. The other thing that uh, she kind of kind of jumps out at me too is that cops, law enforcement, the DJJ community, sheriffs, chiefs, the community expects you to solve murders. They expect you to solve uh, uh, burglaries, arrest, arrest rapists. They expect this stuff from you, but they're going to measure you. They're going to measure you on the little things like playing basketball in your community. Okay, that's what they measure you on, and so it's, it's a very powerful underlying statement to say that our expectation, we're darn good at solving crime, major cases, we're darn good at it, okay, but they're going to measure us on those little things that we do in the community, okay, and again, those are the things that, that are hard to really measure the cops on, so your own agency, your own chief and your own sheriff has to find a way to evaluate you on your effectiveness in the community, right, but how do you measure relationships, because at the end of the day, this all boils down to relationships, you guys can have all the programs you want. I've got a ton of programs. They don't work unless you have relationships, one-on-one. -on -one. And until you understand and, and recognize and embrace that, and again, I talk a little bit about, uh, you know, they, they, Chicago's made a bunch of deposits. Um, real quickly on Warrior versus Guardian. Ever, anybody ever heard of that axiom, Warrior versus Guardian? Anybody? Nobody. Wow, great. 
Okay, so uh, the Guardian operates as part of the community, demonstrating empathy and employing procedural justice principles during interactions. The behavior of the warrior cop, on the other hand, leads to the perception of an occupying force, detached and separated from the community, missing opportunities to build trust and confidence based on positive interactions. So I mentioned earlier about redefining our role, right? We got a lot of military, some of our best cops are from the military, but they will tell you, I was not in but they will tell me and tell you what they did in the military is not similar to what they're doing in those communities, okay? In the military, they moved as a platoon. They didn't really have a lot of individual thought, independent thought, I should say, okay? We, as officers now, we're out there by ourselves. And so you better practice for officer safety some of this verbal judo and some of this procedural justice. So the military is not necessarily like we are quasi-military, we are pseudo-military, a lot of our training is based on military, okay? But at the end of the day, there's a big distinction in our department between some of the officers that want to be warriors and the chief saying, hey, I want you to be a guardian as well. I want you to have the skill set and the training and the equipment, but I want you to have a heart. I want you to have empathy. And so at the end of the day, you've got to be both. So you can have the equipment and the skill set of the warrior, but you've got to have the heart and the compassion and the empathy of the guardian. So it's come up quite a few times uh, recently. So how do we come true as about police officers? We don't like the, the way things are, and we don't like uh, <clears throat> when we have change. Uh, so again, the justice-based policing, when I talked about Susan Raw, uh, what they practice is about de-escalation over physical control. Think how you cannot make an arrest. You know, all of our policies are developed to show us how we can make an arrest and how quickly we can make an arrest and how quickly we can get back in that zone and handle more calls. That's what drives us. Because back in my day, when I arrested a juvenile, I was stuck with that child all night. All night. I had to call, when children and families call something else, they'd have to drive in, look in their database, which I think they had to go through by hand, to see if we were going to hold that child. So if I had a child back then, eight, nine hours. The front desk was usually where the, the babies had all the kids that we either arrested that night or, or were runaways. So we didn't have a lot. And what, what came out after that? What came out early 90s? Jack Sinners. Juvenile assessment centers. I'm like, wow, finally. I don't have to talk to the parents. I don't have to go to these homes that I've been going to for the last 10 years. I don't have to do this anymore. I can just drop this child off and I'm done. And it's their problem now. Because now the Jack Center has to do all the assessment. I know back in, they didn't do a lot of assessing, they do a lot more now. But that was actually, when I talked to our chief and talked, I advocate getting rid of Jack Centers. I say, hey, well, let's shut them down for a year. Let's see how hard we have to work, how many parents we have to call how many homes we get to walk through and see, all right, now I see why that young man is running away or why that young man's on the streets and not living at home. I mean, that's the part that we don't have, we don't have to touch that anymore. We don't see that because of the Jack Center. Jack Center's been great to us. Out of order. Okay, uh, de-escalation or physical control, that's a, big, that's a big nail. A lot of the training that we're going through, all the officers, is de-escalation because our, our, our use of force, our force continuum is always plus one. Right? Officer presence, and then you know, they have a knife, we have a gun, they bow up, we use our spray, our taser, it's always plus one. But I think the thought now is to de-escalate, dial it back, you know, calm your voice down. Because most of these encounters that we're having that are getting escalated are because of what? Mental health issues. I mean, that's a huge, huge piece. And mental health, that goes into a lot of what the school board's dealing with, ADHD, a lot of those kind of issues going on too, which we didn't have back in my day either. But it's all hand and glove, all tied together. Hostage negotiating, okay, that's de-escalation. Okay, those are some of the principles that we have to embrace, I think, in this field. How can I, so on my challenge, my officers, how can I not make an arrest? Okay, we have policy after policy after policy that shows you how quick it is to make an arrest, develop, identify the primary aggressor, develop probable cause, make the arrest, Take them to the county clinker, okay, and then we're done, right? So my challenge to my officers is how do you not make an arrest? Well, if I don't make an arrest, then I have to talk to them. I have to de-escalate them. I have to defuse the situation. I have to talk them down. I have to convince the mom why the son's doing this or tell the son why the mom's doing that. I said, it takes a lot of work. I said, hey, yeah, it does. It takes a lot of work. I said, there's nothing wrong with taking that child to the neighbor's house. Nothing wrong with taking that child to your runaway shelter. I said, but you don't always have to make an arrest. And with that arrest are consequences. Big ones, 
military, education. They have now have a criminal record. 19 years old. Uh, have you ever been arrested? Yes. No? Oh, no, you don't have to put yes. You can put no. Ban a box. Don't, don't answer that question. All right, I'm a liar. So, you know, it's tough. Well, you're 18. Your record's expunged. Don't worry about it. Don't let your juvenile record doesn't matter. What does matter? All right? It matters up here. You know, you're applying for a job and they ask if you've been arrested. You tell them no, you're lying. Or you fail a polygraph. Whatever. Okay. Um, so one of the things, uh, again, uh, in case you guys are Star Wars folks, we got, uh, remember, a Jedi fights only as a last resort. If you are forced to draw your lightsaber, you have already forfeited much of your advantage. A Jedi trusts the Force and at first seeks other ways to resolve problems. Patience, logic, tolerance, attentive listening, negotiation, persuasion, calming techniques. But there are times when a Jedi must fight. So that's uh, kind of appropriate. All right, now I talk about a year ago, 2016, Gainesville, Florida, March 21st. In fact, I was given a, talking to some officers, I think, a year ago that day here, a couple weeks ago. So we had an incident in Gainesville. We had a 16-year-old that was going through a breakup with his girlfriend, and he had a replica AK-47. Replica AK-47. So obviously it didn't have the, the little orange thing on the front because, you know, if it's a replica or a BB gun, they're not required to have those kind of things. So he was at a housing project, and he called and said he wanted to kill himself because he was having his girlfriend just broke up with him you know, as we went back and looked at all his text messages and what he told the dispatcher. So that's the information we have. So he's standing in front of the projects, uh, five um, ASO, uh, Latchew County, it was an, actually a county case. They show up, they call for backup, they ask for the city to come out and help them. So there's nine officers standing around this young man with this, what we believe is AK-47, sedentary. Sedentary meaning no one's moving. He's stationary, we're stationary. Officer finally convinces him to put the AK-47 down, which he does. Puts it down for about five minutes, then he picks it back up. So this whole thing's about 20 plus minutes going on. There's from information from some of the officers, hey, if he retreats back into the apartment complex, we're going to have to shoot. We're going to have to shoot. So the young man retreats back into the apartment complex, okay, and we, we shoot. So nine officers shoot, handguns, rifles, we shoot 35 times. So 35 bullets at this young man, <clears throat> with the backdrop being the apartment complex. We kill him. Okay, we killed the young man. We hit him four times, by the way. So when you look at the Laquan Davis, uh, I'm sorry, Laquan McDonald situation, you're wondering why, okay, so Van Dyke's shooting, nobody else is shooting. Because we have what's called contagious shooting in law enforcement. We see an officer shooting, we're thinking, well, there must be some reason he's shooting. I better shoot too. Now, he has information that I don't have, right? But I think everybody in that situation knew the information. So, I mean, there's a lot of criticism in terms of what we did wrong. And you know, I understand, had the, had the young man just put down the replica gun. And, and we had, it was very difficult to sort of get, we're not over this yet. We haven't reconciled this shooting from a year ago. We're still processing it and still dealing with it. Um, I'm sure there's going to be some lawsuits and other stuff that, that, that come out of this, but um, I went to the grand jury. Of course, the grand jury did what? The grand jury did? No true bill. Um, but they gave some recommendations. Hey, we don't like this. We don't like this. So all my community partners, all my stakeholders, mental health, Meridian, village counseling, school board, crying, Will, 16-year-old, upset that his girlfriend dropped him and we killed him. We don't, we don't like this. So what do I tell them? Well, it's a mental health issue, you know? If we deal harsher with mental health, and that's how we tried to package it. That's how the county tried to package it and come out with these town hall meetings. And I'm like, stop, stop. They don't want to hear about mental health. They got a 16-year-old Gazel High School kid dead. I said, you don't think the rest of the students are impacted by this? And we're going to say this is a mental health issue? Are you crazy? We are crazy, you know? Not a mental health issue. It's not a compliance issue or lack of compliance issue, but obviously, Compliance would have helped, right? We, we, we need to, this, is, this hurts. This hurts the nine officers. You, you know, when I, talk to the, when I talk to my young kids, and I say kids, not my three kids, but the kids that I work with in the community, they're so angry about this. Why did you kill them? Why did you do that? Will, why didn't you shoot them in the arm or the leg? Or use a canine or something, Will? Why did, why did, you, why did you kill them? I'm like, right, well, he didn't put 
what we thought was a rifle down at the time. He didn't put it down. I mean, what did, well, why don't you wing them? You know, shoot them in the arm, the legs. You know, you get a sedentary situation for 20 minutes. Well, we don't train that way. We don't, we, don't, we don't train that way. That's why we didn't do it. Could we have done it? Possibly. If we had shot him in the kneecap, could he have come up firing? Possibly. There's a whole host of scenarios. The problem with mental health, I think, one thing that hadn't been tackled is any time a knife or a gun shows up, all our mental health training goes out the window. <laughs> Done. Fire him. So it was a tough, tough time in Gainesville. It tough for me, tough for the community, tough for all the stakeholders. DMC, system of care, I mean, I've got uh, steering committees. It was very difficult for us to really reconcile what happened here. It didn't, and, and that's what I told the sheriff at the time, although I worked for the police department, I said, Sheriff, I said, I, I don't think the community's ready to have a dialogue. I said, I get the whole dialogue, the benefit of it, and it's powerful, and it's great, but they're not ready. You got, <laughs> we're grieving. There's a lot of grieving. So this dialogue's not really, timing's not good on it. So if you guys ever have dialogues with your community or your, uh, some of your youth, first of all, have them now, today, because there's going to be an incident that's going to come up, and you can actually realize, okay, we've been having these. If you have it all of a sudden in response to an incident, you look a little hypo hypocritical, I guess, you know? A little patronizing, I should say. That, that word fits better. All right? So, um, so what happened? Uh, well, 16 years old, lived with his sister, obviously had some trauma in his house. The school was doing well in school. Uh, had a lot of friends. Um, so that night, um, when he when he was uh, when he was killed, I mean, there was uh, we've done a bunch of good things back in that community, but um, we haven't really gone come together and made any changes in terms of our response and stuff like that. But uh, what was what's the, uh, what I'm taking out of this situation is that we have made so many deposits in Gainesville, so many deposits. Chief Tony Jones, Riker House, everything we're doing in Gainesville, which is what you have to really engage. That we got to pass on this. We got well, nobody protested, nobody walked up and down the sheriff's office or city hall or not one sign. Dream Defenders, anybody. African American, 16 year old, shot 35 times by, by nine white cops. Let me just add that to it. You know, really, nothing, got a pass on it. Why? Why do we get a pass on that? Because of, because of all, all the good work in the community, you know, embracing procedural justice, you know, recognizing DMC, you know, working with the NAACP, working with these groups that you have to work with. So I just throw this up there as an example. Um, wasn't a good time for us. Anybody ever hear about this incident? What happened last year? It was a year ago? Okay. There's actually a, a grainy video if you all wanted to pull it up. I can't pull it up here, but uh, you all have a chance to look at it. Can't see much with it. Are there, uh, are there any questions? I feel like I'm doing most of the talking. <laughs> okay, good. All right. It's, is it 1030 already? Oh, my goodness. Okay, let's go ahead and take a 10-minute break. Yeah. Back there, back.